it gives me great pleasure to welcome Christoph Roy. Now, Dr. Roy, he's actually not a part of SIO, at least formally not yet. He is, in fact, an associate professor in the Division of Biological Sciences in the section of Ecology, Behavior, and Evolution here at UCSD. But don't forget this lecture series is called Perspectives in Ocean Science, and Dr. Roy's research is very closely connected to the ocean. In fact, he told me tonight that he is the only professor at UCSD who really t um, studies uh, marine science, except for all of us here at SIO. <laughs> And it was wrongly billed, this lecture was um, posted on upper campus that Dr. Roy was part of SIO and all his colleagues have been teasing him for some time. <laughs> but he's actually, he's the faculty manager of the Scripps Coastal Reserve, which is just below us here and he's such an integral part of SIO. So he really has a, a very strong link with us. He obtained his uh, bachelor's degree in, geol in geology in Calcutta, India and his master's degree in earth science in Newfoundland, Canada. And his PhD is from the University of Chicago, and he was a postdoc at Chicago and also at UC Berkeley before he came to UCSD in 1995. He's received numerous awards and grants, and he's published many papers. Now his interests are focused on understanding the processes that determine the spatial and temporal distribution of biological diversity in the sea. His work emphasizes not just the traditional kinds of species, but also functional groups and morphological diversity. His, in particular, his lab uses marine mollusks as a focal group to test several hypotheses. One, about the distribution of species in the ocean, and two, the effects of climatic and environmental change on shallow marine species and communities. And three, to explore how marine animal patterns and distribution have changed over space and time. However, tonight, Dr. Roy will be talking about a large research project that his lab is undertaking that clearly uses all the skills generated from all his areas of research to quantify the effects of human impacts on the rocky intertidal animals of Southern California over the past 100 years and the implications for marine conservation. So without any further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Christoph Roy, who will talk on people and nature at the sea's edge, our future. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you all for taking the time to come to this event. Um, as you just heard, I'm a marine ecologist, and a lot of the work that we do in the lab is focused on understanding the effects of climate change on marine ecosystems. But today, I'm not going to talk about any of that work. What I want to tell you today is about the inner tidal zone in California, that narrow zone where the sea meets the land, that's where we do a lot of our work. And it's a habitat that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, and I'm sure many of you have spent countless hours playing in the inner tidal, in the wonderful tide pools we have throughout Southern California. And those of you who have been exploring these tide pools uh, for a long time, may even have noticed long-term changes in the communities that inhabit these tide pools, the plants and animals that you tend to see in these habitats. In fact, uh, the research that I'll talk about today was essentially prompted by many conversations I've had with people while we were out in the field working um, on our ecological work, and who I met doing field work who were curious about the kinds of work we were doing, and the conversation would go something like this. They would first ask us, you know, what are you doing? What kind of things you're studying? And we would explain that we're doing ecological work, primarily trying to understand sort of the effects of climate change on various species and communities. And then it would go something like this, that I'm glad you're trying to understand the ecology of these organisms, but what I can tell you is that for the many years I've been looking at these ecosystems, and the many years range from 10 to 30 or 40, um, depending on who you're talking to, is that 
the tide pools have really changed. And my response, my immediate response would be, well, what has changed? What do you see now that you didn't in the past? Or what, what are the kinds of things you're talking about? And the most common answer was, well, in the past, I used to see many large animals in these pools, which I don't see anymore. Or something like things I used to see commonly in the past, I don't see as commonly anymore. Now, initially, I dismiss most of those comments as essentially wishful thinking. After all, as most of us know, I mean, most of us think the world was nicer and more interesting when we were kids. And we, as we tend to go old, we tend to get a little more cynical, and the world looks slightly different. But after hearing the same response from many, many people over and over again, I finally got curious and, sort of being a scientist, decided to take a look at this in a scientific way. We wrote a small proposal, got a little bit of money to get started, and today's talk is essentially a progress report after four years of looking into this. Now, if you think about the inner tidal, I think the best description of it that I know of is in this book, The Age of the Sea, by Rachel Carson. This is also a bestseller in its time, um, although not as popular, perhaps, as The Silent Spring. However, the way she described it really sums it up, is that th the shore has a dual nature, changing with the swing of the tides. Part of the time it belongs to the land, part of the time it belongs to the ocean. And it does, it is an area of extreme environmental gradients. It goes from being exposed fully to the heat, the cold, the wind, to the rain and the drying sun, and then to fully marine conditions when the tide cap comes in and everything is submerged underwater. So you would think that given that this is an extremely strong environmental gradient, you probably wouldn't expect to see a lot of biological diversity in there. Yet, as she pointed out, the area between the tide lines is crowded with plants and animals. This is one of the most interesting ecosystems on the planet, and it is also one of the most accessible ecosystems in the planet, which will be part of the story today. On this coast, we have a long history of looking at this. This is from Canary Row. John Steinbeck talking about the great tide pool up in Pacific Grove. And as he says, when the tide is in, it's, a, it's creamy, I love this coat. It's creamy with foam, whipped by the combers that roll in, but when the tide goes out, the little water wall becomes quiet and lovely. And this is when most of us try to go in there and take a look at it. This is an old picture from the collections of the San Diego Historical Society, just to make the point that we have been looking at, or we have been playing on the tide pools and playing on the beaches for a long time now in Southern California. And over time, this is what the human population along the co in, in the coastal counties have been doing. This is U.S. Census data, going from about 1870 there all the way to 2000 there. And as you can see, it is an incredibly stunning increase in the population along the coast, in the coastal counties. And most of these pop this population, as we all know, lives within easy driving or even walking distance of the coast. And if you look at the projected growths, we're something like 50% growth is expected in the next 30 years. We also changed the nature of the coast. We also changed the nature of the habitats that's available. This is a picture that I got from the li SIO library archives. This is looking out the coast here. SIO, uh, the pier is right about here. This is 1921. You can see a lot of rock present there. This is roughly the same place, looking at the same direction, 1941. And this is what I took recently. All of those rocks are gone. It's covered with sand. We know that we have changed the sand dynamics along the coast significantly. And this becomes a dynamic habitat. But a lot of those rocks that used to be available in the past are now gone. Now, some of you may remember things like this. I certainly have never seen it. These are intertidal abalones, black abalones on intertidal rocks on Santa Rosa Island. This wasn't taken that long ago. Um, this was before I came to California. I can't even imagine an ecosystem on the intertidal that looks like this. Space occupied by abalone on the rocks. 
or something like this. This was probably taken in Rosarito Beach, again from Historical Society Collections, 1915. These are California spiny lobsters. It's essentially a lobster dump on the coast. It is not something any of us sitting in this room can even imagine. Yet, this is what was common if you were living on the coast at that point in time. So the question that we wanted to ask is, first of all, what is it that we do on the coast? Um, and what are the ecological impacts of all of those activities that we do on the coast? And if you want to bin them, um, you can come up with something like this, this sort of a laundry list. First of all, there's trampling. Anytime we walk on these rocks, we're essentially trampling on the stuff that's living on the rocks. I'll talk a little bit about this uh, in the next few slides. The bulk of the talk would be about this, legal and illegal harvesting for all sorts of different usage from food to bait, aquaria, and any other sort kinds of things. Then we have removal of rocks and dead shells, which many, many people don't really realize that serve as habitat for many of the invertebrates that live on the coast. And finally, we have the chronic effects of pollution, which remains very poorly studied in, in most of these areas. Now, in terms of trampling, um, I want you to take a look at the kinds of habitats that you would commonly see. This is near Bird Rock. Most of the time, if you walk out on the rocks, what you would see is rocks covered densely with algal beds. And if you go to places where these algal beds are not trampled too much, it's like walking on a carpet. They are thick, you walk on it, it literally is walk like walking on the carpet in your room. If you look closely, this is what it looks like. This is a close-up of some of the algae covering, covering the rocks. Then you can take a little sample. We, te we tend to use a tuna can. We put it in there, we take the samples, then we bring it back to the lab. And look under the microscope. This is looking down at one of those algal samples under the microscope. And when I look at them, I tend to think of this habitat as a forest in the miniature. If you look at this, when I look down the microscope, look at something like this, this is not too different from sun dappled leaves if you look out at the canopy walking in a forest. And just like a forest, if you look at the various algae, they come in various morphologies. Some have a lot more intricate morphology, a lot more areas than others. There is a huge diversity of algae on those rocks, which most of us, when we're walking around, don't even pay much attention to. We then take the algae, we wash them out, and actually ask, what are the plant animals that actually live in these habitats? And I'll show you some. I don't have time to go through the entire uh, biological diversity, but this is an intertidal ostracod. These are crustaceans. These are very, very small, less than a millimeter. And you can see a little foraminifera living on this guy. Here's more of them. They come in a huge variety of morphologies. And what we are finding, I have an undergraduate in the lab who's actually looking at this, this fauna in conjunction with my postdoc. And there are actually, turns out, quite a few undescribed species of ostracods living in the intertidal rocks he, right here in San Diego. So if you want to find undescribed biological diversity, you don't have to go to the tropics. You don't have to look anywhere else. You can look at arthropods right in our own backyard. And that's where they are. There are other things in there. It's chock full of animals. There are other things in there, some things that are more familiar. These are micro mollusks, micro snails in this case. These bars are actually one millimeter. So you can see some of them are less than a millimeter. Some are come in morphologies that are more familiar. Others perhaps not. They come in a huge variety of morphologies, colors, and whatnot. That's a, that's a millimeter right there. Then there are other snails that tend to be common, but they don't really look like regular snails. These things are actually very common. The cecum, um, they, are, they have lost the coiling, but nonetheless, they are perfectly good snails. And they come out in droves if you wash, wash these samples. A very important component of that, that community. There are many other things. I, as I said, this is the last slide I'll show on those. I don't have time to go in them. There are pycnogonids, there are amphipods, big crabs. This, this is a millimeter there, so this is, a, this is a big guy compared to what you've seen so far. 
and all sorts of other things that, you, that look down, live down there. Most of those we don't, don't, can't even identify to species level. And undoubtedly, in most of these groups, at least in the arthropods, there are many, many species that are not yet quite known to science. Yet, when you look at most of those rocks, in most of those habitats that people commonly go to, this is what you tend to see. Gone is that thick carpet that you can walk on. You can see bare rock in most places. You can see other things live, living on there. Those of you sitting close, you can probably see lots of little barnacles here sitting there. A few limpets, other things coming in, this very, very thin green algae. Essentially, the stuff that's very slippery, slippery slime essentially taking over these rocks. And this is the common picture um, that you see on the coast. The best example of this that I know on the coast is if you go to Cabrillo National Monument and you go to the tide poles, you walk down those stairs where most of the people go, this is what you will see. You'll have to be careful not to slip and fall because all of the slippery stuff growing on the rocks. Take a little time, go into what they call zone two, which is further in where fewer people go. All of a sudden, you'd be walking on a carpet of algae this thick. And then finally, if you're lucky enough to go into zone three, which is a human exclusion zone, the carpet is even thick, thicker. It's nice to work on. This is analogous to me, at least, when I look at this, to clear cutting. I don't know of any other example or other analogy than saying, well, this is the intertidal analog of clear cutting. We have gotten rid of the forest, and all we have left is bare rock. And with that forest, have all the animals that live in there are now gone. And just like clear cutting in the tropics or any other area, a lot of that diversity, we still have no idea what is it that we're losing. And there really is no, at this point in time, there is no concerted effort to even catalog any of this biological diversity. That's all I'll talk about trampling. There's actually experimental work being done in Paul Dayton's lab to look at the effects, the ecological effects of some of those tramplings. What I want to focus on are more on macroorganisms and the effects of something like this. This is something one of my graduate students took. This is essentially poaching of mussels for bait. You see this if you go out there on the coast on a nice day. You'll see many, many examples of this comes in various forms. And once those mussels are taken, this is what it looks like. Nice clumps of mussels in two sides. And here's the patch where they were taken, essentially for fish bait. And this is what it looks like if you look in there. Few remnants of mussels here, lots of debris. And that's essentially what many, many parts of our coast are beginning to look like. Now if you look at, I like to sort of go back to old literature and look at what people have been talking about the coast for a long time. And here's again one of my other favorite things from Cannery Row. Um, here Steinbeck is talking about how Doc used to, whenever he got an order for small octopi, he would drive all the way down to La Jolla from Monterey to collect lots of bags of octopi essentially to go sell to maintain his biological supply company. Now, nobody in their right minds would try to collect octopi out here today and actually run a biological supply company. You'd go bankrupt very soon. And the reason for this is partly this. This is, not, this is from Between P Pacific Tides, a book that I think most of you know is essentially the Bible for Intertidal Ecology. It was early on written by Ed Ricketts and then many, many editions um, have been made that are still in print. And essentially, it's a little known fact that not too long ago, people used to go out to the pools, essentially poison the pools um, by dumping poison, and then when the octopi was stunned, catch them and harvest them. Thankfully, it's a practice that we no longer have, but it took, uh, it took a toll on the fauna. And, and today, if you go out, as most of you probably know, to La Jolla, like we do, you will see octopi, they're there, but they're certainly not in any numbers that you can run a biological supply company with. You can look at things even further back. This is a wonderful uh, paper that came out in 1892 by somebody called Mrs. M. Burton Williamson. She was essentially a very serious amateur shell collector. And here she's talking about White's Point, a popular place up um, in Palos Verdes Peninsula up in Los Angeles County. And at 1892, she's talking at the fact that basically black abalone is all but gone from White's Point. 
This is long before anybody started worrying ab about the decline and the potential extinction of abalone on this coast. Closer to home, this was a master's thesis done out of Stanford in 1928. This is Mission Bay. And again, Morrison's talking about collectors who have collected from Mission Bay for years report the entire disappearance of certain forms where they used to be previously very common. Same sorts of things, 1928. Here's a another snippet from a 1968 edition of Between Pacific Tides. And this one actually really nails what's going on. And essentially, if you read it down here, what it says is the result is of too many chowders, too many conchologists take this as too many people, and the animal's slow rate of growth. You put all of these things, at least these three things together, you really have a recipe for disaster. And that's what we're seeing on this coast right now, as I'll try to show you in the next part of the talk. So the question for us was, well, OK, so there is anecdotal evidence talking to people or going back to the literature of things that are changing. But how do you actually put a number on it? How would you convince somebody who's saying, well, this is part of a natural change, that things really are changing because of human impacts? And what we decided in the initial grant, and we're continuing this work now, is to take a more informatic approach, if you will, given the computer databases we can use, is essentially we set up a big computer database where we said what we'll do is we'll go to old archives of information, things ranging from museum collections, old survey data, to anecdotal evidence, anecdotal accounts from people, basically any piece of evidence that we can find about somebody talking about a particular species at a particular locality on the coast, we'll put them in here. And then we'll also do a whole bunch of surveys at particular localities along the coast and put those data into this same database. What's the rationale for trying to get a handle on these long-term changes? Well, the rationale is if you use the old, the historical data, you should be able to come up with certain places on the coast, certain localities, which have a good historical record. And once you know what those places are, you can go out there and do the surveys and simply ask, compared to the past, are the species that were known from that particular site in the past, are they still there? If not, who's missing? Are there new species come in? How has that community changed in its makeup? And also, you can look at other ecological attributes, things like sizes of organisms, body sizes of species that you can measure from the past collections and you can measure today. And do that comparison. Now the rationale that you know we're using to do this is we by comparing localities that are essentially protected from human impacts with those that I like to call totally trashed. These are the two extremes and in the middle you have things that have suffered intermediate impacts. This category is where most of the marine or the intertidal reserves on the coast are including our own Scripps Coastal Reserve, which I happen to manage, it has a lot of impact. For reasons I won't go into it, we can, we can talk about it later. It's in this middle category. And so the rationale is by doing these comparisons, we can separate out natural changes due to climate change, environmental change, and those sorts of things from human mediated, direct human mediated effects. We want to put all of this stuff on the internet. The goal of all of this down the road is to share the entire information. Once we are done with this, you should be able to go to the website, click on a particular place on the coast, ask which species are known from this place and at what period of time in the past. Where are we? As of last week, there's about 10,000 records in the database at 451 localities in San Diego, Orange, and Los Angeles counties. We haven't gone much further up simply for logistical reasons. This takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to compile. You essentially have to go to museum collections, pull open individual drawers, look at labels on all those collections, bring them back to the lab, put it into the database, and so on and so forth. It's a slow, tedious, painstaking process, but we think it's worth it. We have about 125 mollusk species. We have others in there. So the total is about 300 species of various things. The earliest record we have goes back to 1869. So you can certainly have about a century worth of coverage. It's certainly not as good as all sites, but some sites go back a century. 
What I want to do for the next part of the talk is share with you some results. We have analyzed some of the data and what can we see so far. What I want to focus on is impacts on body size of endotidal invertebrates. Now if you talk to ecologists, any ecologist will tell you that if you had to measure one organismic trait, it probably should be body size. Because size correlates with so many different aspects of a spe the life history, the biology, the ecology of a given species that it's a pretty good surrogate for getting a handle on ecological impacts. It also is an easy thing to measure and you can measure it by, at, by going back in time using old collections. Okay? So that's what we tr decided to look at. I'll show you data for four species, very common species on the coast here. Those of you who know a little bit about intertidal invertebrates will recognize them. I'll talk about the owl limpet and I'll talk about quite a bit of details about this guy. I'll talk about Fissurella volcana, a small limpets that live on the underside or on the sides of rocks, common but somewhat cryptic species. I'll talk about Tegula, uh, and then I'll talk about Acanthina spirata, or more recently this is called Acanthinusella spirata, uh, important high intertidal predatory snail, again very common, you can probably see it pretty much at any tide pool you go to in San Diego. These are the sites we looked at going from LA all the way down into um, San Diego County. The ones that are in these triangles are actual field sites where we went there and we exhaustively sampled every, well, we tried to sample as exhaustively all four of those species at that site and we measured the sizes of every individual that we encountered on those exhaustive searches. The open circles are museum collections and other sources for which we have body size data for those four species going back in time. And again, that data goes back about 100 years. Okay. In red here is Cabrillo National Monument. That is the only place on this stretch of the coast that has a human exclusion reserve. And that essentially, if you want to think about a reserve throughout this stretch of the coast, that is worth really calling a reserve. If we only have one, and that's Cabrillo. And you'll see in a minute why I say that. What we did was we took all the, those data then and essentially plotted them against time, binned here in temporal bins. So this is Tegula orientinta, again, a common Tegula. This one's actually eaten. People harvest this for food. And you can see even the recipes in there from between Pacific tides. Um, this is average size, this is on a log scale here. Um, this is average size pre-1960 in our data. This is 1960 to 1980. This is all the data we collected in the field in our surveys. Okay. All of the plots that I show you on this will be arrayed like this. And obviously there is this strong decline in body size if you go back in time. Things really aren't as big now as they used to be in the past. Now if you're a skeptic and you're looking at this, you could say, well, okay, so there has been a size decline. How do you know this is because direct impacts of people. It could be because of climate change, it could be because of other effects that we don't know. Our rationale for testing that, that idea was to go to Cabrillo National Monument where we have a reserve that excludes humans, run the exact same surveys we ran in other sites for the exact same time using the exact same methods and ask what do we find at a reserve where we exclude people. For this species, this is what you find. If you go to Cabrillo, you can get size distributions back that mimic what used to be in the past and that are entirely out of line with anything we see anywhere else on the coast. Okay. This then gives me very good confidence that this is because of people, not because of other incidental or other climate change or something else. This is that other snail, this is Acanthinusella spirata. We don't know of anybody who eats them, but again, you see the same decline in size going back in time from pre-1960s to today, right there. And there's Cabrillo. If you want to find big snails, go to Cabrillo, don't waste your time anywhere else on the coast, at least not in Southern California. 
Give you one more example, this little thing that lives on rocks, fairly common. Again, we don't know anybody eats them. There's pre-1960s, there's our field data, and there's Caprio. I think you get the picture. I'll show you one more in a little bit of time. Everywhere we have looked, every species we have looked, we see essentially the same thing. A very strong decline in size. Things are getting smaller and smaller over time. The only place we know of around here that you can get back to get bigger animals is in the human exclusion reserve. So based on that, you can have a couple of take home messages. The first one is that sizes of inner tidal mollusks, at least the ones I've shown you, the ones we have studied, in Southern California have decreased significantly due to human impacts. This effect is pervasive and present in species that are directly exploited, like tegula, and I'll show you in a minute the owl limpet, but as well as species that are not known by us, at least, to be consumed by humans. Uh, we have ideas about what's going on, and I'm happy to talk about that in the end of the talk, but I'll leave this at, at that for now. So then the next question for us was, well, okay, so things are getting smaller. I, I like to call this downsizing nature. Uh, things are not extinct, things are there, but they're smaller than the, what they used to be. And the question is, biologically speaking, ecologically, what does that mean? For the point of view of the organism, from, from the point of view of the species, what does that really mean? And this is my poster child for looking at that. Um, I have a graduate student who's actually doing his PhD thesis on this. This is the owl limpet. Many of you probably know this critter. It is the biggest limpet in North America. The maximum body size of this maximum length that we know of in the museum collections is about 120 millimeters, which is pretty big for a limpet. I have never seen an animal that's that big. The biggest one I have seen is about 100 millimeter. It's a fairly common and wide-ranging species. It ranges from about mid-Baja to Northern California. It just goes just north of Bay Area, um, just into, into um, a few, few hundred kilometers north of San Francisco. It's a very long-lived animal. Okay, we can age these things. We actually have tagged animals on the coast. We do mark recapture to actually look at growth rates. We can also section the shell out and actually look at the growth bands. Just, you can read growth bands just as you can tree rings and age these animals. A 100 millimeter limpet is somewhere between 25 to 30 years old. It's a very long lived animal. Incidentally, this is not that unusual for a lot of intertidal mollusks, intertidal snails. The tegula that I showed you lives to be 20 to 25 years old, the big animals. This is a remarkably interesting animal because it is, it is a protrandic hermaphrodite. What it means is that when it settles in from the plankton as tiny little larval uh, organisms, they're all male. There are no females when, when it settles in. And somewhere along the way, as it settles in, makes a home for itself and grows, changes from male to female. Okay. And the end result of this is all of the large animals on the large end of the size spectrum, the vast, vast majority of them are females. All the small ones are male. I'll show you um, a little bit of data on that. The large females of the species, the large animals, are they have essentially the 10 gardens. They'll clear space, they have a little garden, which is their territory. They grow microalgae in there, and they'll keep the garden clean just by being a biological bulldozer. It essentially bulldozes small mussels trying to settle in there, or small barnacles, and keep that whole area clean, okay? And tends its garden and eats the microalgae. Males don't do that. The, little, the smaller males, which is, don't have the body size to be the biological bulldozers, can't do that. And this animal, the problem with this animal, essentially, from the perspective of the species, is it is incredibly, apparently, it is incredibly tasty. I don't know for sure. I haven't eaten them. But here's that plot again, going back to our data. Now, we don't have a very good historical record of owl limpets, because the shells are big, and they're, often, they're hard to often pry off the rocks. It'll break the shell. They can clamp down with a lot of force. So we don't have a good record of it, not as good as the other ones, but for what it's worth, here it is. It is a significant decline. 
and there's Cabrillo. This gives you some idea of what this probably should look like if you had better data. We are trying to fill in this gap for this particular species and some others by actually going to kitchen middens and looking at archaeological data because this has been harvested on this coast for a few thousand years. This thing is chock full in kitchen middens. So we will fill even further back for this species by going there. Just trying to make the point that you can go to one particular site on the coast and play that same game. And this is Palos Verdes Peninsula up in Los Angeles. My graduate student, Phil Fenberg, surveyed this, air, this few sites there and measured roughly close to about 1,500 individuals. We pretty much know what the size distribution of our limpets look like there. This is what the, it looks like. This is pre-1960 data from museums. What I want you to notice is this tail the big tail is essentially missing here. There's plenty of small ones, but no big ones, and it's got plenty of big ones if you go to pre-1960. Now here's that business about sex ratios. What is that harvesting of big animals, preferential harvesting of big animals, doing to the species? Incidentally, because we have so many marked animals on the coast, and we do mark recapture, we know how people are harvesting them. We often will go back to a site, and all there will be left are scars of things they have taken. We had measured all the animals at that site in the past. We know which ones they took, and you can look at it, and every place they do, it's always, the, they'll take the big animals. They ignore anything that's 40 millimeters, 30 millimeters, just not worth the effort to take them. Um, in a couple of cases, at least in one case in Bird Rock, I actually got a phone call on a Sunday, Sunday afternoon, um, somebody called me up and said that I just saw two guys with kitchen knives taking owl limpets from a plot I've been looking at for many times. This was right after San Diego Union Tribune did a, did a thing on, on, on owl limpets and size declines based on that paper we published. So we rushed out to Bird Rock, it was fresh cars, and sure enough, they took everything that was, there was lots of animals at that site at that time that were fairly large, larger than 70, they were all gone. So if you go back to that site now, they're all small. Now, what's happening to it? Well, we're starting to get data on sex ratios at individual sites. If you go to protected places like Cabrillo here, in, in this tan color as shown the females and this hatched bars are the males, you can see at Cabrillo there are plenty of very large females, even larger than 80 millimeters, and small males. Compare that with our reserve down here at Scripps, Scripps Coastal Reserve, essentially there are no large females here. There are still females, but not, no large females. This is Vandenberg Air Force Base near Santa Barbara, another of sites with very little access for most people. It's a protected site. Same story, lots of large females. Here is White's Point, perhaps the saddest story of all, that part of LA County. You just don't have any big limpets left. But note that there are still a few small females in there. You can plot it in a different way. You can plot the sex ratio for individual populations as a function of their size. Remember, given the biology of the species, it, the sex ratio will be male biased at the small end because they all settle as males. And it'll be very much female biased at the high end because they all turn into females, or at least most of them. So then you can ask, well, if we compare protected sites versus unprotected sites, where is our 50-50? At what size do we reach a 50-50 sex ratio? And here it is for the unprotected sites, you get it at about something like 45 on this graph. You go to protected sites, it's something like 65. So the story here is that's beginning to emerge, we've still got a lot more work to do on this, is the same as that's being emerged in exploited fish, is that the animal is trying to adjust. They are changing sex earlier. You just don't see big females at these exploited sites, but they're trying to at least change sex earlier, trying to maintain the sex ratio. Okay, as I said, this is work in progress. The last word is not out on them, but we, we ho hope to get a better handle on this. And what I want to do in the few slides I have left is talk about the consequences of this. As I said, they're essentially biological bulldozers. They keep open a lot of vacant space. And if you look at it, here is a limpet sitting right there. It's a 63 millimeter limpet. This is its garden. Here's another one sitting right there. It's a 54 millimeter limpet. You can see it's got a smaller territory. I'll show you this one. 
I wonder if anybody cares to guess the size of this one. If you care to do it, you probably can. That one happens to be 41 millimeters. And the last one up here, that one's 39 millimeters. Okay. The larger the animal, the bigger the territory, and so on and so forth. It keeps open bare space on the rocks. We're doing removal experiments um, for using advantage of some of the other work we have to do. Here's the limpet that was removed. Here's the scar. You can see it back there. 31 days later, same quadrat. The limpet was here. You can see lots of algae has come in, small barnacles have come in, lots of other things come in. The empty bare space is basically gone. You remove a large territorial limpet of that size, you basically open up space for other things to come in and colonize. Okay. Ecologically, the makeup of that community changes. And to make a very long story short, we're measuring biomass of these organisms for the limpet biomass. And one thing that does happen is in the exploited sites, you do get many, many more small limpets. For the same reason as the previous slide is when you take away the large territorial animals, the smaller males can come in and many smaller males can coexist. So the, interestingly enough, in the trash sites, local density of these limpets actually go up. So if you didn't, weren't paying attention to other aspects of the biology, you would say, wow, there's lots of owl limpets at Scripps. Yes, that's true. And there's lots of owl limpets at a lot of trash sites, but they all happen to be tiny. Here's biomass, just measuring biomass, again on a log scale. Here are all our unprotected sites. Here are our protected sites. You can see that's a significant difference in the limpet biomass between the two. So despite the fact there's a lot more in terms of counts, a lot more small owl limpets here, they just can't match up to the biomass of these large animals that are being taken out of the system. Visually then, just to wrap it up, what does it look like? This is Vandenberg Air Force Base. This is what a nice normal place should look like. Big owl limpets keeping open all of these bare rock with muscle patches in between. This is what our rock should look like, at least a lot of them. This is what the coast should look like. What does it really look like? Well, this looks like something like this. You can go to lots of places and you would see something like this. Compared to this one, Roughly the same size quadrat. This has six limpets. Maximum size is 78 millimeters in this case. This has 14 limpets, over twice as many. Maximum size is 31 millimeters. Tiny little things living here. Call it territory, if you will. We put a question mark there for that reason. If you look on the rock, very little bare space. Lots of other things living in. Mussels, barnacles, um, algae, you name it. It's a very crowded place. So essentially, if you compare these two slides, you can get a visual impression is that whole inner tidal ecosystem has really changed just by removing this one important element that keeps open bare rock. And that is, is ultimately the ecological consequence of this sort of harvesting for that particular species. I want to leave the data there. Um, I'm running out of time. But getting back to Rachel Carson, um, what she was talking about is that, you know, the shore is an ancient world. And as long as there has been the ocean and, and land, we have had the intertidal habitat. And if you look at, in the literature, if you look at people talking about it, it really is a habitat that keeps alive this sense of continuing growth and what she called the relentless drive of life. I thought this was a very nice way to sort of capture the essence of this ecosystem. And this is partly, perhaps, why so many people flock to these tide pools, why so many people on a nice day with low tides would do nothing rather than go look, in, look around, poke around, and play in the tide pools. Yet, the inner tidal ecosystem in Southern California, at least, is a tragedy of the commons. There is absolutely no doubt that the best way to describe this is a tragedy of the commons. Now some of you, I'm sure, is familiar with this term. Those of you who aren't, a commons in this sense is essentially something, a concept that's been around for a long time, but it was first illustrated by Garrett Harding in an essay in Science Magazine in 1968 in the ecological context. And he meant it as, or he defined it, as a commons is any resource that's used by everybody and it belongs to everybody. 
Okay? So the best way to think about it is imagine a pasture that open to 10 herdsmen and each has some cattle on there, but the pasture can only support a certain number of cattle. Now, if there are no constraints on use of that pasture, then the tendency of every herdsman is going to be to maximize the benefits from that pasture. And so every time one of them puts in an extra head of cattle on, on that pasture, the rest of the herdsmen would also tend to put in another extra cattle on there. And if you let the cycle go, and you can show this mathematically, if you let the cycle go, the end result in this hypothetical case is overgrazing to the point that the pasture can't support any cattle at all, and the whole system collapses down. Now, this is a concept that's now common in economics. It's a concept in common in many other fields, not just ecology. In, in ecology, in a tidal ecosystem is the best example I know of of a tragedy of the commons. This is not a habitat where there's a lot of commercial interest. There's not a lot of commercial fishing going on. There's not a lot of pressure from real estate development. None of the stuff. None of the kinds of things that we worry about when we talk about fisheries or when we talk about vernal pools. We're not talking about any of it. It is a habitat that essentially belongs to all of us. We all use it in ways that suit us the best. For some, it's poaching. For others, it's trampling. For others, just going for a Sunday stroll and looking at things. But the end results of all of this use, this no unrestricted use, is the system is gradually, gradually sliding down, downhill. And as I said, the way I like to think of it is we're gradually downsizing this ecosystem. So the good news then is if Cabrillo is an indication, then existing conservation laws that are on the books in the state and federal, if you can properly enforce them, you can minimize the effects of these human impacts. Cabrillo has done it. We have an example where it has happened. The bad news is that for most of our existing quote unquote reserves, I always put these things under code because they really, we really aren't doing a good job in, in, you, in enforcing the laws in these reserves. Um, those are really not worth, at this point in time, calling reserves. So finally, just this last slide on what can we do. Um, we can talk for hours on this, what we can do, but it basically boils down to this, is we need better awareness of the problem. Many people who use the inner title don't even know that walking on those algal beds does a lot of damage. Trampling is a problem. And that there is that much of biological diversity in those habitats. So we also need better participation from the public. Uh, we probably need better developed system of docents that can actually try to help enforce these laws in conjunction with outreach efforts, just better awareness so that people will value these habitats, not just for use, but for future generations to actually have some look at something that has some semblance of what it used to look like in the past. And what I like to think in that, that context, I'll leave you with this thought, is we have, in this country, we have a wilderness ethic for terrestrial ecosystems. When you go to a state park or when you go to a national park, you stay on the trail. You don't go trampling everywhere because there are consequences to it. But consequences aside, each and one of us are sort of geared with that ethic and we don't go off the trail. Think about it when you go to the end of title. You're free to go anywhere except at Cabrillo. You're free to go anywhere. You're free to walk on anywhere. We don't have that ethic. And the question is, can we, the, the end of title, as long as it's not trampled to death, as long as it's not poaching to death, by all definitions, is a wilderness. And can we have a wilderness ethic that we can apply to the inner tidal? If we do that, we can save these habitats. If not, we will look out on the coast and see what we see today. I need to thank a lot of people, um, collaborators at various universities, two postdocs, multiple graduate students, some at SIO, these two in my lab, and one at Berkeley, lots of undergraduate research assistants, and then in terms of funding, this whole project was started by money from State of California through the UC Marine Council. They were generous enough to support us when nobody else would. Um, that's what got us going. The San Diego Foundation came in right about the same time with a critical little bit of money to keep us going for a year. And I'm happy to say that NOAA California Sea Grant has finally picked up for the, at least the next two years that we can keep this thing going. 
Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your time, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, so the question is, how long has the Cubrillo um, nat natural monument been close to humans, at least a part of it been close to humans, and then have we sampled in the Channel Islands National Park? Cubrillo is essentially somewhere in the 15 to 20 years. So that's actually another take home message, it doesn't take that long. If it's a scale of decades. Uh, so if we can protect it on that scale, things will come back. We haven't seen a lot of extinction in these systems, at least not for the species I talked about. On the Channel Island things, yes, we have. And you can guess the outcome. If you go to the ones that there is a lot of human um, impacts, Catalina, for example, you see the same sort of thing. If you go to the ones that are harder to get at, you see big animals. So again, it's predictable. Okay, so the question is at Cabrillo, are there still a lot of octopi? Yes, they're there. Um, they're there. There is a habitat effect of where these things can live. As you know, different tide pools have different sets of species. They're not that common at Cabrillo, but they're certainly present. Uh, just as they're present off the coast here, if you go to Bird Rock, you can see them. They're just not in any abundance. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a good historical record of those things because they're not preserved, so we don't know if they're changing in size or not. So the question is, I talked about the biomass, but fecundity is perhaps more important, and what do we know about the changes in fecundity? Um, as you know, fecundity po is positively correlated with size in these marine invertebrates. And so the fe we're actually measuring fecundity by looking at, looking at the animals we're sacrificing. And there is a huge effect on fecundity. You can do the calculations and it, the fecundity clearly is going down quite a bit at these sites where um, it's mostly small males. So it is another impact that I didn't have time to show with the data. So the question is how much interaction there is between the intertidal ecosystems on one hand or either the kelp forest ecosystem or near shore um, marine ecosystems. Quite a bit. A um, lot of you know, things like owl limpet, they have planktonic larvae. So larval supply becomes an important driver, an important component of all of this stuff. Uh, one of the things we're worried about in the owl limpet at Cubrillo is, some of you may have noticed on those size frequency distributions, is there's a lack of small animals. There's a lack of very small animals, which tells us that there's not a lot of recruitment at Cabrillo at this particular point in time. So somehow, the larval supply at Cabrillo is being impacted. Now, nobody knows why that's the case. One hypothesis is that that has to do with the disappearance of mussel beds at Cabrillo. These things actually tend, our limpets tend to recruit in mussels. And for reasons that are not because of human poaching, because Cabrillo excluded humans, but for reasons that really we don't understand, mussel beds are kind of gone from Cabrillo for a while. And that may have something to do with the larval supply. So getting back to your question, coast, near shore oceanography has a tremendous effect on some of this. And so changing patterns of longshore currents can affect at least locally the recruitment and then cascading down into the population structure of the species. So the question is, do we know at what age the males turn into females? Um, we don't know for sure. Um, they're doing it, obviously they're doing it earlier at these trash sites because they're smaller. And there's a reasonably good correlation between size and age, although it sort of asymptotes out later. Now, one of the things we're trying to measure is actual growth rates at individual sites. So it's slow. In another couple of years, we'll have a better answer to that. Now, on that same topic, we also don't know how they change size. The traditional thought on it, or sorry, how they change sex. The traditional thought on it is sex change happens when they find a little bit of space, set up a little territory, and then you see that switch. There's some experimental support for it. But the mechanism through which it 
happens is entirely unknown at this point. The good news is, about three weeks ago, I finally got, got the news that a group at Berkeley, in conjunction with the Joint Genome Institute, is going to sequence the genome of Lodia. So in another eight months, we'll have the entire genome for this animal. And then you can go in with tools of developmental biology and actually study the molecular basis of exactly how this thing changes sex. And then we can take it back into the ecological arena and look at that. So the hope is we can, you know, the reason I say this, this is my hope is this will be a poster child for looking at all of this thing because you can go from ecology to the genome and, and connect all the dots in between down the road. So the question is, with, with the approval of the Coastal Commissions, if we put up signs in, in, let's say, this area and protect some of these populations and study them over time, is that feasible? I think that's certainly a great idea. Um, that's certainly one of the things one could do. I think what you will need, what we have found at um, Scripps Coastal Reserve is signage by itself doesn't work that well. I think what you'll need is some sort of a docent program that goes hand in hand with that. Um, because people tend to well, not everybody, but there is a significant number of people who come to the coast who really don't know much about the tide pools or the area that will ignore those signs. That's what we tend to see because we have signage on the Scripps Coastal Reserve. We try to maintain them. But, but I think it's an excellent idea. Something like that combined with the docent program is probably the way to go.